Gas laws are always a fun thing to teach. And if I <laughs> took a certain sample of gas at a certain pressure, kept pressure constant, and decreased the temperature, we know what would happen. The volume would decrease. We like to show that as a nice little linear relationship. But is that what really happens to real gases? Gases like carbon dioxide, nitrogen, oxygen. Can you really continue to decrease the temperature and have the volume decrease in a nice linear fashion all the way down to absolute zero? Of course not. What happens at different temperatures for the different gases is the intermolecular forces start to take over when they get moving so slowly, and the volume changes dramatically. Once you've got that, it's condensed to a liquid, and the volume stays pretty much the same. So we're going to try taking six different gases and predicting what's going to happen to them when we cool them down. Now I've already filled up some of these. This is some carbon dioxide in this, and a couple different ways you can do that. You can do it from a canister of carbon dioxide. You can do it from a baking soda vinegar reaction, just in a flask, and then transfer it here. Um, by the way, you might notice how I've got these connected. I've got a little piece of glass tubing. I cut the very corner out of the Ziploc bag and then taped it to that glass tubing. And that makes for a very convenient little way of connecting a gas sample to a test tube. Um, carbon dioxide in here. Actually, this was made by taking a small piece of dry ice and putting it in there and letting it sublime. And now it's been filled with carbon dioxide for a while. So there's that one. Um, I've got some oxygen. Again, you can get this from a reaction, potassium chlorate decomposing or hydrogen peroxide. I actually just use an oxygen cylinder. Easy way out. Helium. <laughs> Not a whole lot of ways to gain helium, so we got a helium tank for that. Hydrogen. Lots of ways of doing hydrogen, but uh, we had a hydrogen tank for that. We have a nitrogen, which I haven't filled yet. And the methane, which I haven't filled yet. I'm going to show you the methane filling right now. Let me Make sure that test tube doesn't roll away. And just to give you an idea, these are one hold stoppers. So all you have to do is fill it up like that. Put my finger over it there until I'm able to get in the test tube. And I know. I didn't get this filled up. If I wanted to, I could flush that with a little methane. It doesn't really matter. This is mostly the methane, enough of it's leaking down in there. And um, for the liquid, for the nitrogen, where am I getting nitrogen from? Well, I've got liquid nitrogen right here, which I'm going to put in this styrofoam doer. This is what uh, acids are usually shipped in, the protective layer there. And I'm going to take a little bit of this liquid nitrogen. And um, I'm not really coming in contact with it, but it's a good idea to use these gloves. This liquid nitrogen is obviously one of the coldest things you're going to have to deal with. <laughs> this might be overkill because all I want to do is scoop out a little bit of it with this little <laughs> styrofoam ladle and put it in my nitrogen test tube. So let me reach down in there. Did I get some? Yep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. So I'm going to hold on to that. More important than to be on this hand, yeah? Because this is not. And put, it doesn't take much. Okay? So we got a liquid nitrogen there. And here's my bag. And fill that up. Now I can just kind of give that a little swirl. And that fills that up nicely, okay? If I put too much in there, I can just pour the rest back in, okay? Okay? The coldness is all down at the bottom. Up here at the top, I'm still fine. Okay, so there's my nitrogen. I did put more than I needed in. So I'm just going to pour the rest back there. Okay? So now I've got them all filled, and I want them all in the liquid nitrogen to see what happens. Which of these gases will liquefy? Here's my helium. Here's my hydrogen. My oxygen my carbon dioxide, and my methane. And if they do liquefy, what does that look like? Now, you might think about it. Is this, how's this working? I'm not cooling the gas out here. I mean, 
I'm just going the test tube. But if that gas is in the test tube and it liquefies, that creates a little bit of a low pressure area in that test tube, which, as you can see, it's starting to do it already with some of these. The atmospheric pressure then squeezes the bag and pushes more of that gas into the test tube. So what I'm trying to say is to cool this entire gas sample down, I don't have to put the entire bag in liquid nitrogen, just the bottom of that test tube. And it's about maybe, I'd say about three centimeters worth of liquid nitrogen in this container right now. Okay? So while we're doing that, let's make some predictions over here, this chart. I have the melting point and boiling point in Kelvins for the six gases we're looking at. And really, it's just look at the boiling points, 21, 4, 77, 90, 109 for methane. Carbon dioxide, of course, doesn't really have a boiling point, melting point. It sublimes at 195. An easier way to represent that is with these, this graph here, in which the blue, dark blue is the solid, light blue liquid, and the green is the gas, and just showing the transitions of them. And it shows that helium is really the one that ha would remain a gas. If I took a helium balloon and cooled it down, it would act ideally and change its volume linearly until we got down to around four Kelvin, and then it would condense one Kelvin freeze. Hydrogen is a close second in terms of that. And there's nitrogen and oxygen and their information. Of course, carbon dioxide remains a solid up to relatively high temperature and then goes right to a gas. Now, here's what I did. I drew a line that represents 77 Kelvin. That's the boiling point of the nitrogen. Why? Because that's that temperature that the liquid nitrogen is at. It's at its boiling point. No reason it would be below that, and it can't be above it or it wouldn't be liquid. So what would happen to these? What's our prediction about hydrogen? Well, think about it. If I cooled it down to there and that's it, we'd expect it to remain a gas. Same with helium. So let's go back and see. We've seen some major changes in some of these. Look at that. Um, but here is my hydrogen. No change in this. And nothing going on inside the uh, test tube. Nothing in there. Bunch of mist coming off of it. But So there's hydrogen. Kind of boring in terms of what's going on here. Here's my helium. Ditto on that. Nothing. And we don't expect anything on those two. Okay. How about nitrogen itself? This is interesting. We've got nitrogen. Is liquid nitrogen cold enough to condense gaseous nitrogen? Well, it's right there at that transition temperature. It's kind of the same question as if you put your freezer set at exactly zero degrees Celsius and put a tray of, of water in to make ice cubes, would you be able to freeze it? The answer is no. The temperature would drop to zero, and it would remain zero degrees Celsius water for it to freeze, you have to continue to remove heat from it, and the only way you could continue to remove heat from it is to have the surroundings be a lower temperature. So a zero degree Celsius freezer cannot freeze water. A 77 degree liquid nitrogen bath, Kelvin, cannot liquefy, condense nitrogen. So our nitrogen bag, just like that. Nothing in there, and all just like the others, okay? But the other three, yeah, we've got something going on there. Um, let's kind of move this off to the side a bit. Let's start with the carbon dioxide. No question about it. Carbon dioxide would not only have condensed, but it would have frozen. And actually, those processes put together, going directly from gas to a solid, there's a name for that. Solid to a gas, sublimation. Gas to a solid is called deposition. So we would expect that solid, that solid to form in there as good old dry ice. So let's see what we've got. Um, which one of these is the? They're all labeled. <laughs> so here's my carbon dioxide. And in the bottom of that, you can't really see it so much through the test tube. I'm about to show you that if I just warm it up a bit in this water, that's going to help loosen it from the sides. And now, using the overhead camera, let's see if we can't get some of this. Look at that. You know what that is right there? That's dry ice. That's right. I got more of it in here, though. Let me. There it is. It's a nice little tube of it. Can you see that? That's dry ice made from carbon dioxide. Um, and can you see from the top that that is a nice little tube of it? 
And now you can also see <laughs> how it is not regular ice, but dry ice, doing that nice little thing there. Okay. So I was able to freeze my carbon dioxide, and now I'm subliming it back again. And now <laughs> we've got oxygen. What should oxygen have done? It should have condensed but not frozen, so I'm not expecting to see solid oxygen in there. And the methane we should have condensed and frozen if we leave it in there long enough. This might take some time, just like just because you put an ice tray of water in the freezer at negative 10 degrees Celsius, it doesn't mean it freezes like that. Condensing takes place pretty quickly. The freezing process, a little bit longer. Um, let's go to the oxygen. Okay. Can you see that? It's got a rather unique color to it. Did that show up? It's a pale, kind of a robin's egg blue. Let me put it back in there and see if you can see that again. Yeah, is that showing up? Okay. So, one nice thing you can do with that, I've got a strong neodymium magnet here, and I can get rid of this now. And I put it in here just to kind of help remove that condensation so it doesn't show. But I'm going to show you that oxygen, liquid oxygen, is fairly paramagnetic, attracted by a magnet. Can you see it? Going up the side of the test tube there, is that showing up? Okay, I'll put it in there one more time. Yeah, okay. So, oxygen molecules are actually paramagnetic. You wouldn't expect that, but unless you do the bonding-antibonding diagrams, which kind of gets to some high-level chemistry, it turns out oxygen is paramagnetic. Now, here's the neat thing you can do. I'm going to take a piece of paper towel just a little bit smaller than the test tube. And actually, let me set this down in here. The top of these test tubes are not that cold at all. Paper towel burns, you know that. Would a wet paper towel burn? Hmm. No. Why? Because the water that is wetting it is blocking the oxygen from getting to it. But what if it's wet with oxygen? So I'm going to stick this down in my liquid oxygen. I'm going to put the cap back on so I can kind of give it a little shake to get more of it wet. Okay? So now I've got a paper towel that's cold and wet. Not very good conditions for burning, but it's cold and wet with liquid oxygen. So I'm going to take that out of here. Okay? And let's put that back in there. A cold, wet paper towel could it possibly burn? Yeah, pretty well. <laughs> okay. And I've got my water still here so I can help extinguish this. Okay. That last part was the part that hadn't gotten wet with the liquid oxygen. That was pretty impressive. What about my methane? Okay. Last one. This we expect to have actually solidified and we've got kind of a milky, some, can, some solid up here on the sides, but otherwise it's kind of a milky, it's in the process of freezing. We just leave it in there for about a half an hour to get a solid plug of it. And I've done that once, and I dumped it out on the table like I did with the carbon dioxide, and it looks like wax, which makes sense. I mean, after all, it is a hydrocarbon. It's the baby of the wax family. It makes sense that in a solid form it should look like wax. What can we do with the liquid methane? Well, what's methane known for? Oh, we're going to do that over here. That's right. <laughs> Let me tidy up a bit here. Get rid of the helium and the hydrogen, for sure. <laughs> and uh, this, either. Um, we've got our liquid methane in here. And it's frosting over pretty quickly, so you can't see that. But coming out the top, as I swirl it, it starts to boil a bit, is a little bit of methane, which I can light. And now I've got a really strange situation where I'm holding it because it's cold at the bottom of my thumb and warm at the top of my thumb, so it's like just in the middle there, room temperature. <laughs> okay? And just a slight little touch here makes the flame grow a bit because of the warmth of my hand making the boiling grow faster. Of course, a much faster way would be to put in a little bit of water there. 
<laughs> Don't want to burn the place down here. Okay, so there is our uh, liquid methane boiling, being converted to gaseous methane, and the rate at which it's boiling, of course, depending on how much heat I'm going to put in there. I can blow it out, not to worry about that flame anymore. Okay, one little piece of advice on this, you generate the liquid methane this way with a bag of it. You don't want to then have that left out in the liquid nitrogen like this, open to the air, and then go and do this. And here's why. Remember how oxygen was able to condense. Well, if you got liquid methane in there, and now it's still cold enough, and you have oxygen from the air condensing in there, you would have a mixture of liquid methane and liquid oxygen. You do not want to go and light that. I've heard some horror stories about uh, explosions from that. So, but the way I did it, keeping that stopper on there until I was ready to light it, that's fine. Okay? So, um, now one little final thing I'm going to do, kind of a fun thing to do with my leftover liquids. Let me just kind of put these off to the side here. My liquid nitrogen. I've got um, Hate to have it go to waste. And this one I definitely do need the glove for. Not for this part of it, but for the... Um, oh, stopper, piece of copper tubing, rubber hose, and <laughs> I don't know. I think this was a Happy Meal prize at one point in time. Should I put some polyurethane foam in the back? And well, let's see what this is good for here. Okay, so glove on this hand. Um, I can pour it directly into this, but I'll miss a bunch. Okay, so here we go. And watch the surface up here. And I'm gonna, don't wanna aim this at anyone for sure, because as soon as you put this in there, you get a wonderful dragon's breath. And the best part about this demonstration <laughs> is how that tubing has become so cold, it becomes very rigid. So there's a fun way to dispose of some leftover <laughs> liquid nitrogen. So cooling gases, lots of things to be learned from it, the chemical properties, the physical properties of these different gases as they cool. Thank you very much. The way um, to make these bags for the cooling of gases is to take a bag and take the very corner of the Ziploc bag and just snip it off. You're maybe cutting off five millimeters worth on the end. Then you could use just a piece of glass tubing. I've actually taken a uh, eyedropper glass, broken off the very tip and fire polished it. Just I like having this little ridge here. You'll see. It's, little advantage there. So I'm going to, from the inside, insert that through that little opening. I didn't make it quite big enough, so it stretches a bit, about halfway. And then you're going to want to take some electrician's tape, okay, and just wrap it securely around that glass plastic interface and get a good tight seal there, okay? Then this gets inserted into the large end of a one-hold stopper, okay? Then don't forget to zip up the bag again before you fill it and squeeze out whatever's in there. Um, this then fits in the test tube, but as I was showing, if you wanted to fill this then, you've got this little opening of the, of the stopper it can fit onto a gas tank, onto a glass tube, or in this case, onto the Bunsen burner gas jet for filling it up. and then you're good to go.